Hi guys, welcome back to Technic Matters. Today, once again, we have uh, myself, Clinton, JJ and Adams uh, here to present to you on our views on the first question which you guys have voted, which is, am I a quad dominant squatter or posterior dominant squatter or hip dominant squatter? So uh, at the end of this video, basically we have, each of us is going to present our own slides. We have eight minutes or so to present it. And at the end of it, we're going to have another about eight minutes to have a round table talk among ourselves. Uh, eventually and in future, we are looking at trying to invite more of you guys who are interested to come into this Zoom call as well so that we can answer some questions straight away. But because this is the first time we are doing this, uh, apart from the giveaway, so we're going to give it a go first. And if you guys are interested in joining us on the next one, we will post out a poll so that you guys can participate in it and be uh, and join us in future. Okay, so... I'm going to start the presentation first. So the question is, once again, am I a quad or posterior dominant squatter? In a, uh, squatter? So the question for uh, each and every one for, uh, who are lifting will be definitely, am I a quad? Uh, do I feel my quads when I squat or do I feel my hamstrings and glutes when I squat? Or the next question could be, am I more upright or lean forward when I squat? So all these questions can determine uh, whether you are hip dominant or or quad dominant squatter. Okay. All right. So the most commonly the most common way to judge a squat is based on body proportion. So this is the most basic uh, coach view or uh, analysis view by most of you guys. So typically we want to try and measure our femur length against our torso length. So as you can see from this image here, on the left is basically Wei Ping, on the right is me. So we are all in a position and set up uh, where we feel the strongest. So for Wei Ping's case, he feels that flats is, he feels better in flats and for me it's obviously heels, okay? So in this context, uh, because of the limited resources that I have at this point when I'm presenting the slides, uh, I cannot get to have Wei Ping to be directly on the same image as how I can be, but we'll do as much as we can. So what's happening here is me and Wei Ping has, uh, have the same height, general height, which is about 169 on a good day is 170, I guess, CM. Um, so <laughs> uh, depending on how we squat, it depicts a very different way and different feeling when we squat, okay? So on the left here, you can see that uh, on this picture, you can basically see that uh, our female length is almost similar, but our torso length is different. So you can see the green dot and the red dot here in regards to the hips. Okay, so what is the difference that compensates with the same height is basically uh, Wei Ping's shin against my shin and uh, Wei Ping's neck and hip length height to my height. So as you can see, because of Wei Ping's shorter torso, it creates a more acute angle, which means he needs to lean forward more. So it will look like in the left, uh, the left illustration that Wei Ping is a more hip dominant squatter. Whereas for me, um, because of my longer torso, I can allow my knees to track forward more, which is why I'm more upright. So in this case, because I'm more upright, um, it will be assumed that I'm a more quad dominant squatter. So in order to make it clearer, I have this uh, another uh, depictment to show you that because of the acute angle and difference in angle, it can result in a difference on how it looks and how it feels when you squat. So once again, on the left, weeping, he feels uh, because of his shorter torso, he feels that uh, he requires more hips to do the work when he squat. Okay, whereas for me, because of my long torso and similar female length it allows me to be a, more, a little bit more upright. But here comes a missing factor because we cannot measure uh, accurately and why, and one, one should actually think and put consideration into how much he brings the knees forward. So how much we will bring the knee forward in this case for me. So we should add in the consideration of ankle flexion which is right here. Okay, so now that we have three factors, which is the femur length, dorsal length, and then the ankle flexion, 
we can see the squads a little bit clearer because now there are more points to see. Okay, so as you can see here, if we add the ankle flexion in, uh, what basically happens is you can see that Wei Ping has less ankle flexion. So as assumed that this is his strongest position, he feels that it's either that he cannot, he doesn't have the ankle mobility to bring his knees forward. That's why he has to force his hips back or he still have to he still needs to work on his knee forward position so what happened is because i bring my knees forward i have better ankle mobility and also i wear heels it allows me to be in a more upright position and bring my knees forward so now let's assume that both of this lift right both ways of squatting uh we feel the strongest so um it is very obvious that on the left uh, picture where Wei Ping is squatting, he feels that he's more quad dominant. And whereas for me, I'm uh, sorry, hem uh, posterior dominant. And whereas on the right, I'm more quad dominant or more balanced. But once again, I feel that this is quite a big mistake because uh, how should it is like your teacher in school teaching you physics or math will be very disappointed in you if you actually try to uh, put different units of measurement into comparison. Meaning, uh, if you look at femur length and torso length, for example, they are in CM, right? So how can you put CM and ankle flexion, which is the angle, into the same comparison? It doesn't make sense, right? So what should you do? Basically, uh, what I feel is the most important to judge is based on the hinge points, which is the points which are bending. So as you can see here on the left picture, uh, the hips, the knees, and the ankles. Uh, the ankles. So right now, instead of looking at length and ankle, uh, and angle, we are looking at all three points of angle. The the difference in angle. So right now, uh, uh, what I can show you is the three different kind of squat. But we have to try and keep things very constant. Uh, for example. I'm wearing all three depictments. I'm wearing flats. And also my objective is try to bring the bar down as much as possible, trying to maintain balance, which means the bar over the midfoot. So as I'm going down, I experience uh, many different uh, feelings, but the objective is trying to bring down as much as possible without losing the balance. So as you can see here, all three pictures uh, results in a very different kind of behavior. Okay, so on the up left picture, you can see that uh, I try to bring my knees as forward as much as possible to the extent where I'm almost losing my balance forward. So what's happening here is my torso angle in relation to the femur, the knees, uh, the femur, I'm a little bit more upright, but I find difficulty trying to hit that because um, I'm maxing out my knee and my ankle flexion already. So at this position, I feel that, wow, I'm very uh, restricted and I cannot go any lower. Okay, so this is one. Then on the right, I try to visualize myself as weeping. I try to squat as uh, hip dominant as possible by restricting my ankle mobility. So as you can see, the angle of my ankles are reduced. And, and what happens is it creates a more lean forward torso. Okay, so once again, it's very hard for me to hit that. And obviously, if I want to hit that in this position, I just need to knees out and probably sit down. But what will I affect? It will affect my torso uh, positioning. So most probably, I have to round my back some way or another to hit the that and then come back up. So obviously, in a squat, we do not want to lose tension on the torso area. Okay. So lastly, this is a more well-balanced squat, which I feel in the most strongest position, this picture over here. So what happens is uh, I try to balance out the angle of my uh, hips to my ankles. So as you can see here, there's another angle here. So ideally, the case is we want the angle of our ankle flexion to be almost similar to the angle of where I bend my uh, hips. Okay. So in this position, right, I feel the strongest. Why? Because Efficiently, effectively, I'm trying to balance out the equation uh, of using my hips and knees at the same time. Okay, so 
in this picture, what can it show? Uh, what does it show? It shows that if you have a, in my opinion, I feel that if you are a more hip dominant person, it means that uh, this, is, this is what favors you better, but there's inefficient leg extension in my case. So what I need to work on is to improve my ankle mobility to bring my knees forward so that I can achieve a more well-balanced torso angle so that I can drive with all my lower body. Okay, so if you are someone like Wei Ping on the right here, right, um, you'll find a lot of difficulty coming up because of the torso positioning and uh, the inefficient position to allow leg extension. Uh, sorry, the, the knee to extend. Okay, whereas in this case, is, I mean, it's very clear cut, right? If you are super upright and you bring your knees forward, you can bring yourself up. And if you want to hit depth in this position on the left, you obviously need to bring the bar forward. When you bring the bar forward, you kind of lose balance. And what happens is when you come up, this will happen. Your hips will come up, will rise, and then the bar will go back to the center and then you come back up. So you are, once again, put, putting yourself in a very in, inefficient position. Okay, so what is the most efficient and strong position in my opinion, I feel that to be honest, if you are a hip dominant person, you need to work more on your quads in order to get it more efficient. If you are a more quad dominant, quad dominant person, you need to try and balance it out to the hips. The moral of the story, story is, in order to get a more efficient and strong squat, especially at the bottom position, you need to be able to calibrate your torso angle, meaning how much you sit back or lean forward. And, uh, and it's very related to how much you flex your ankles so as to allow your quads, hamstrings, and glutes to work, meaning everything on the lower body to work, okay? So think about this. Your hips, knees, and ankles, all the points which are bending, they are your steering wheel, okay? So for example, I ride a motor motorcycle, right? Steering wheel is more the, the handle. So if I want to turn left or I want to turn right, this is where I control. These are the control units, okay? So the quads and the glutes are actually your throttles. They are your driving force that brings the weight up. So whether or not you're visualizing yourself pushing against the floor or standing up, lifting yourself up, they are your control units, the, uh, sorry, the, the power to bring the weight up, okay? So the hamstrings and the glutes are basically the suspensions, the supports that help to keep you safe, okay? So imagine, uh, driving a car without suspension when you hit a brake or uh, when you hit a lump you're going to feel a lot of uh, tension and uh, discomfort so hamstrings and glutes are more like the suspension they can also serve as a brake uh, especially at the bottom to see how low you want to get okay so obviously with all this said um, what I actually advise is we want to always try to maintain your torso angle not more than 45 degrees down. So you have to stay 45 degrees and above so as to maintain a good position to allow the quad to the knee extensors to work. So for example, if you sit back all the way right where the angle starts to go very uh, acute more than 45, it is very, very hard for you to create that uh, extension. So all you, we, all you are using is actually the hips, which is the glutes to drive your hips forward which is quite impossible if the weight is very heavy. So ultimately, it's best to get a balanced position. Okay, so how you should squat, uh, you should also try to meet the requirements of uh, when, you, when you compete. So the referees have to, you have to make sure that you are hitting that. So what I find uh, inefficient is, uh, this is all based on my opinion. So the way I squat is, I like to, I used to squat in flats, but I realized that because of the lean angle, the torso angle, uh, it is harder for me to uh, work towards my full potential, which is uh, my stronger position, which is my quads. Okay, so this results in me trying to get myself into a more huge position so that I can reduce the torso angle. I can reduce the angle of my uh, ankle flexion as well to create a more upright position so that I can create this position where I feel the strongest and I can allow more quad drive. So, if I were to wear flats, I will most probably, what, what will happen is most probably my hips will go back more and my angle will lean forward more. Okay, so at the end of the story, two things to take away. If you are a more hip dominant person, 
you want to try to find ways to improve your knee extensors. If you're a more quad-dominant quad person to the most extreme, you want to try and think of ways to engage your hips more by sitting back a little bit. Okay, So at the end of the day, instead of looking at how you squat, it's more important to see, uh, to feel how you do it. Okay, so um, feeling the squat is more important than how it looks. Okay, so obviously it cannot look like shit. Like you have to look decent. So all these cages of the torso angle helps, but ultimately you want to make sure you feel your quads, hamstrings, and glutes at different aspects of the time of the squat, so as to make the squat work. So this is my presentation, and I'm gonna. Uh, stop share now so that I can uh, allow JJ to present next. So, so in answer before, so for my presentation, I, I think I'm gonna just keep it uh, slightly different, and I, I think we just have to, uh, how I want to start is actually looking at what everyone talks about squatting and hinging and all these kind of things, but I think one of the key terms to really define is what is our principal understanding of a squat? <clears throat> so you see a lot of uh so in my in my opinion a squat is actually an imaginary exercise. Like there's no it, it's just a it's just an arbitrary kind of marker of this exercise that we, we put a we put a weight on our back and then we 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 just move it so that our hip crease is below the knee. Okay? So a lot. So this this is the reason why I think that a lot of people think that in order to squat you need to put a barbell on your back. But but I think that if we look at the main movement principle of what a squat constitutes, we can answer this question. The question of um, whether I'm a more quad dominant or a uh, hip dominant squatter. So to to kind of describe the <clears throat> the kind of the way I look at a squat. I actually borrowed this idea from uh, Dr. Pat Davidson. So a squat is basically uh, any, think about a lift, like a lift shaft, right? So a squat is basically where your pelvis moves up and down the lift shaft, ideally. And a hinge is li literally uh, uh, your pelvis moving like a lawnmower, so back and forth, all right? So in this idea, we're, we're trying to think about, okay, where does, where does the kind of, um, so where does a powerlifting back squat kind of sit on this spectrum of whether it moves up and down or it moves front and back? Okay. So if we look at all the exercises that 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 causes the pelvis to move up and down, or all the exercises that we classify as a squat and all the exercises that we classify as hinge exercises, um, this is how I would kind of <clears throat> set out a kind of spectrum of where everything kind of lasts. So if you look at the one end of the spectrum where you are very, very vertical something like a heel elevated goblet squat will allow you to keep your pelvis as upright as possible and move up and down this elevator shaft with very minimal back and forth movement. And then as you progress the, the weight up into a front squat, you'll still be quite upright. And then you slowly put the bar on your back, so you start to lean forward slightly. And then you, in order to, to go down your pelvis, you need to kind of have a slight of uh, posterior translation, so you need to move back slightly so that you can maintain a bar on your back, and then move up and down. And as you go into a low bar, you start to get a bit more quote-unquote hingy. And then, so, and then after that, you move into your uh, exercise like a sumo deadlift, where it's also more kind of, you, 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 there's still kind of, mostly the movement should be your hips coming towards the bar, but there's still a bit of, there might be still a bit of up and down movement of the hips, and then a conventional deadlift. And then a Romanian deadlift where your, your hips are just kind of uh, moving back and forth. And then a trap bar deadlift. And the reason why I put the trap bar on this uh, on the far end of the hinge pattern is because um, with the barbell that's in front of you, sometimes some people will find it hard to necessarily reach the bar with just a pure hinge. So if you move the bar closer towards your center of gravity, you can just execute the hinge more effectively with less up and down movement of the pelvis. So this is how I classify the difference between a squat and a hinge. All right, so why is it important that we understand this concept is because when we want to, when we talk, when we are talking about a quad dominant or a hip dominance sort of exercise, we need to look at what what is happening uh, at the pelvis, and we need to understand what what are the kind of positions that we can put the hips in, 
and subsequently the rest of our body in that will enable us to use more of the, the appropriate musculature for the squat and then from there we can kind of define and understand oh, okay like why do i squat the way i squat and why and um why, why do i prefer to squat the way i squat or why do i why do i use my quads more than using my hips and why do i use my hips more than i'm using my quads okay so so this is uh so this is kind of like an anatomical description of what really have uh, of the three planes of motion so when you move into a squat there are actually a few kind of things that happen if you just look from the side you have obviously your flexion and your extension so i think what's important to note here is if you look at uh if you look at the where is my cursor why is it gone okay if you look at the sort of hips and the pelt and the uh, and the femur you can you can obviously create Obviously, when you bend your hips and you need to come out of a squat, you need to have hip extension. And, as, and you, when you go down the squat, you need to have hip flexion. So why, why is this important to know? Is because when your pelvis moves back, right, you're actually kind of running this sort of pelvis over the femur. So imagine if your femurs don't move, right, and you just kind of move back like this. So now you're biasing yourself into, into a position of relatively less uh, hip flexion. So you have you can't you can't uh, flex anymore. So you need to extend your hips forwards to create that to create that movement. Okay. And so similarly, when you go into the bottom of a squat, you are now in a in deep hip flexion, and then you'll need to extend your hips up as well. So what happens? Why is this important? Is because most people when they don't have a good hip position. So imagine if you're hyperextended, right? You actually close yourself off. Um, of some uh, hip flexion. That's why some people will need to hinge a bit more as they get, go down to the bottom of a squat. And then that will, that will, what will happen is what Clinton said, where you will start to compensate with your back because now you've run out of the range of motion to actually um, go into deep hip flexion. So if things like you hyperextend your back, you will actually create this uh, relative uh, hip flexion by uh, closing down the, the space in the front of the hip. Okay, so the analogy that, uh, that people use is if you want to go from store if you are in a lift and you want to go from story one to story 10 you want to be able to go the full 10 stories which would be equivalent to your full range of motion you will need to start from level zero or level one but if you start from level three which is where your your hips are kind of anteriorly tilted and you're running your your uh, yourself into hyper extension now you're starting from level three so you can only go up seven levels up so you don't have the full range of motion and because you don't have the full range of motion you'll need to find that range of motion by compensating through uh, somewhere else and where that compensation is likely to happen if you see for most people is they tend to want to create that knees out position so once you don't have that straight up and down um, hip flexion and extension movement you will try to find it in external rotation or uh, or internal rotation and usually Usually for powerlifters, because of the way we are we train, we kill more hips, we kill more knees out. Okay, so and is so there is a rotational movement as well that happens when you are moving through uh, hip flexion and extension, but um, that's not really so crucial, crucially important uh, for this discussion. But it is, in my opinion, actually the most important thing. That, like the rotation is actually probably one of the if you if you can find the rotation, you, everything else will, will be sorted out. Okay, so this is what I, what I mean by hip flexion and uh, extension. So you, you can also see that when you knees out, what are the muscles that will get stretched out and what are the muscles that will get shortened? So things like your glutes will get shortened when you when you knees out because now you're bringing your your glutes are pulling kind of closer to your knees closer towards your hips through moving that knees out and your adductors will actually get lengthened because you are now uh, stretching out. So you can do it. You can do your knees out through two different ways. One is you actually throw your knees out, right? Or the other is actually by extending your extending your pelvis. So when you extend your pelvis forward, think about a hyperextension. You will already relatively have pushed your femurs further back away, and that is why your like if you ex hyperextend, you sometimes feel that your adductors get tight. Okay. So same thing. So if you, if you can see the adductor longest being stretched out when you move your pelvis front and back away from each other. Okay. 
So the simplest way to answer this question of whether you are quad dominant versus your hip dominant is actually is very simple. You just ask yourself what muscles are getting sore after training, right? So if you're tra if you're training and you're and you did a like a tough squat session, and you feel that okay my quads are my quads are really sore. I don't really feel my I don't really feel my hip, my glutes and my hamstrings. Then you know okay I am probably a bit more biased towards towards a being a quad dominant squatter, okay? And if you just and if you squat after your um hard squat days, you don't really feel your quads, and you just feel your hips, like your hip flexors, your your glutes and your hamstrings, uh, getting really really tight and really really um sore, then likely you are more hip dominant squatter. So this is just a simple way of of categorizing it. If you don't want to go and uh measure your leverages and stuff, you just let your body tell you um what is the kind of what is the kind of muscles that you are using, and um. The most important, uh, not really the most important thing, but like if you don't feel your quads, your glutes and your hamstrings and you feel your back, then you probably need to find, then probably asking this question of whether I'm more quad dominant or hip dominant is probably not so important because you probably have other issues that you need to address first, such as working on like your bracing and stuff like that so that you can allow your quads, your hips, your hamstrings to work more efficiently. Okay? And, and addressing that position will also allow you to maybe find some range of motion elsewhere. So if we go back to the elevator analogy, if you start on level 3, you can only go 7 levels up to level 10. But if you start on level 0, so you orientate your pelvis well, you orientate your ribcage well, you'll be able to move through the full uh, 10 stories and the full range of motion. Okay? And so that if you will find that once you sort that kind of position out, you might be able to move yourself a bit better. You might find that you have more ankle dorsiflexion to now feel your quads and now feel, or you might need, you might be able to now sit deeper into the squat without, without, um, and sit deeper, further back and deeper into the squat without rounding your lower back and actually feeling your glutes and your hamstring working. So in terms of, in terms of <coughs> practical takeaway for, for me, I think one of the things that's actually quite important to look at is, um, is, uh, Thinking about how much volume you can tolerate, I think that's level, uh, the first level. So there are some people who, who I think there are some athletes who I coach who will say, oh, I cannot, I cannot uh, handle so many sets of squats because of I always feel my back, I always feel my, um, my hips. And then that causes me to not be able to deadlift well. And usually these are the people who, who are more quote unquote, uh, hip dominant squatters who will also comparatively have a bigger deadlift than their than uh their squat and the reason i say this is because if you if you look at the kind of continuum of a squat and a hinge when you when you low bar squat you actually and if you are required to sit back a bit more you have now made your squat more of a hinge so you can think of your squat days now as becoming a, a quote unquote more of a zero point half hinge day so when you squat, you're also hinging. And that's one of the reasons why that musculature that allows you to propel and create that hip extension, you just keep getting stronger and, your, and the muscles that allow you to move up and down are not really being adequately trained. So this is something that you, that you can consider by looking at your programming and how you can, how you can use various exercise selections to maybe able to, uh, to target some of the different musculature a bit better. So say, for example, if you are a more if you are a more um, quad dominant squatter and you need to train your hips a bit more. So doing exercises that were, first of all, you need to fix your movement patterns. But that, that's, that's always the number one um, uh, priority, right? So if you use a certain, like you have a more hip dominant squatter, maybe you can use certain patterns that will uh, give you a better reference for what it means to squat with a more upright posture. So something like a huge elevated goblet squat will allow you to target your quads better and at the same time allow you to stay more upright, manage your rib cage over your pelvis, and then use your glutes and your and your hamstrings to also create that hip extension as well as using your quads to create that knee extension. And so this is something that you can do through your exercise selection as well as your accessory work. So biasing yourself in more into one of those positions will allow you to train better. And also, this is, this is uh, the, the fourth point would be periodization. I think this is very important because I think a lot of people tend to think that, oh, because I am a certain, I am a more hip dominant squatter, 
So I will always need to work on my quads and my quads are always going to be um, the weak point. So they spend like maybe a whole training cycle working on their quads, trying to bring up their quads, which is a good thing. But, but I would say that if you think about it, you don't have to chase every, all of these adaptations at the same time. So maybe if you're further away from competition, what you can do is actually prioritize your weaker points, try to bring those uh, weaker qualities up and try to integrate it into your main squat pattern because one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, problems that I face is people think that, oh, I, I can, I'm doing a lot of leg extensions on my squat and I'm not getting stronger. It's like, yes, because you're, you chose an exercise that only creates, uh, that is very isolated and it's not integrated into what your current uh, uh, understanding of the score is. And I don't mean understanding in terms of theoretical model. I think understanding in terms of a motor and coordinative uh, manner. So think about it this way. Because you're, say if you're doing leg extensions, the leg, you, only your knee is extending now. So you, your, your brain doesn't have the understanding of how can my knee extend while my hip is extending. Okay, so when you go back to your squat, you'll say, oh, my quads, I did get stronger. I hit some uh, leg press PRs or, or whatever PRs, but then I'm still having this sort of hip shooting up position. It's because you don't know how to use your, you don't know how to use your quads with your glutes and your hamstrings at the same time. So this is something that you, you that, that's why the exercise selection is very important. How you pick will allow you to integrate it into your current uh, kind of, software in your brain and as you get closer to competition what you might want to do is then focus on then focus on what you're actually strong at so if you're if you are more quote unquote uh hip dominant squatter you can then use exercise selection to kind of bias yourself into just you uh, using your hips to to create a hip extension for that squat and getting more um so getting more stimulus there and getting more recovery and adaptations there that will make you stronger um, overall yeah so that's my presentation and to be honest i also don't think that this the question of whether uh, hip dominant or quad dominant squatter is necessary the most important question when you have a lagging squat i think what you need to think about is how can i position myself in a way that is that will give me the best performance and some and sometimes and you also need to re realize that at the end of the day uh, how uh, how your position is like how like what position you can get into is kind of based on your leverages and you might find that even though you've spent a lot of time working on your weak points that there will always be a weak points and that's just one of the reasons because of like like your leverages you can't really change those things so this is uh something that if you if you feel like uh it's holding back your score i would i would say that maybe for focus on finding and setting yourself up in the most optimal position and just making that pattern really, really clean rather than, rather than uh, thinking of muscles and uh, how to bring up your weaker ones. And ideally, you should be in a position where you can feel your, well, uh, what Clinton said as the, the throttles working the hardest. All right, man. So now that you have heard uh, JJ's presentation, it is time to have Adam uh, to get you to present what you have for us. Okay, guys. So this is my presentation on are you quad dominant or posterior dominant in the squat? Okay, so first of all, we'll just need an understanding of torque. So torque is a rotational force, uh, the force used to turn an object. Okay, so... Um, as you can see here, this is the pivot point of a, a, a shifter. And then the longer the shifter handle, the more force generated into the pivot point. So that's just a brief thing on force. So what does this have in relation to the squat? Okay. First up, we've got on the left-hand side, we've got a... First of all, I just want to re uh, just go over the ignore the bar positioning up the top, and we just want to focus on the hip and knee uh, positioning down here. So, on your left hand side, you've got a hip uh, dominant squat. You can see is there's a smaller angle at the hip joint, which is where you're generating the most uh, torque, where you're activating your posterior chain here and your glutes, then your quads, 
And then you see that there's a, gr a greater um, angle here at the knee joint where there's less torque, okay? Then let's have a look at the other end of the spectrum where we've got uh, a smaller angle at the knee joint, smaller cut out of the pie, and then a big cut out of the pie at the hip joint. So you've got more torque generated through the knee joint, which uh, the answer is this is a knee dominant squat, so more torque at the knee joint rather than the hip joint. And then in the middle, we've got um, equal uh, angles from the hip and knee joint, which shows you a balanced squat uh, between the hip and knee. So in theory, for most people, if you can get it, uh, I want to reiterate, ignore the, the uh, bar positioning on the bat. And we just want to focus down here is we want to get a balance down here to get uh, the most bang out for your buck. Uh, so um, using your posterior chain and your quads in a well-balanced manner in the squat. Okay. So how do you find a good mechanical position in the squat? So first you will need to dictate your bar placement on your back. So for majority of people it will be a low bar and then your stance. So for example, uh, people with long femurs might typically want to go wide stance, but that depends on mobility and et cetera. I'll go through all that in a minute. But then your hip mechanics. So uh, long femur typically want to sit back in the squat and a short femur typically want to sit down in the squat. And um, I'll show you in a pretty cool animation that I've got ready here of how that works. So, uh, full credit to this website called athleticdesign.se. Um, you can play around with the thigh length here. So, you can go super long, unrealistic femur bones, and then you can go really short femur bones. So, let's play around with the femur bone, uh, this really short one right now. So, let's just try a sit down squat, and then that's just a nice, well balanced squat there. You'll see down at the bottom of the squat, you've got a nice even hip and knee angles here. And um, this is where you probably want to be in the hip direction in a perfect world, okay? Let's try a sit back squat with a short femurs. So we should try sit back, vertical shins, and you've got like 90 degrees here with hip and shin bone, and then you've got most of the angle here in the hip uh, where you've got more the torque, mo all the torque in the hip. So this is a very hip dominant spot. Uh, probably not ideal for a very short femur person. Okay. Now let's play around with long femurs. I'm not going to go all the way to the other side because that's just really hard to play around with. But um, <clears throat> let's just try a sit down squat with a, someone with a long femur and let's see what happens. Boom. Dorsiflexion run out of room at the ankle. Okay. So that's just not going to work out with this with someone with a long femurs there. So let's try a sit back squat with someone with long femur, sit back, control the bar pass straight and down midfoot and boom. It will suit a, um, it will suit better with someone with long femur to sit back in a squat typically. Okay. So yeah. Go over again if you want to go and check that out, athleticdesign.se. Um, you can actually see the link right there. You can play around with it. All right, after that, uh, after determining what you want to do with your hip direction, uh, your femur size, and your bar placement, let's talk about shoes. So, um, with your shoes, the best practice. If you want to decide either if you want to go flats or heels, you want to film your squat from the side. You want to put 70% load on the bar and then just go completely barefoot because that's just to the total extreme with flats. Can't get any flatter than barefoot. Um, and then see how your squat mechanics behave with a flat feet. And then, and then once you get to the bottom of the squat, what you want to do is freeze frame the squat in the hole, and then look at the angles from your knee joint and your hip joint, and then see uh, where if they're balanced or if they're more knee dominant or hip dominant, and then um, and then 
try that out with a heeled shoe if you can if you have heel shoe available heel shoes available or you can find a weight plate or something similar in the gym or wherever to a similar fitness to whatever heel you want to try out and then just stick it under your um, under your heel um, and then squat with that and then see what your squat mechanics are like with that and then freeze frame it down at the bottom and then see what the difference in relation to hip and knee angle there. And if you can kind of balance that out along with your, you know, your bar placement, uh, femur length and, um, and um, shoes and also obviously maintaining a straight bar path to your midfoot, then um, that'll be your best bet for uh, bar positioning or good mechanical positioning for the squat. So, uh, moving forward. So next, we've got other considerations. So, we're all not built. Dif uh, we're all built differently, right? So, um, you you come across these these unforeseen uh, um, circumstances that you cannot see because the bone you, you can't see your bone structure. It's unless you go out and pay big money to get it all scanned. But um, things to consider that not everyone has the same hip socket. You know, you can see the, see the two differences here in the angles and then uh, a front view here, two different uh, angles from the front. And then we all got different femur lengths with different um, femoral over here. And then we've got two different uh, femorals here, with lengths and angles here. So, you know, obviously maybe someone with this angle probably want a, a wide stand external rotation. So other considerations to bring into your squat is your genetics, your hip structure, your femoral, general mobility, um, if you can get in that position pain-free, um, and then, you know, torso length. So how, how, how do you find that good stance and, and, and to be able to get in that good position and squat and be able to squat deep, pain-free? I remember recommend you guys to go check out this video. It has uh, Stuart McGill in there. He demonstrates how to find that, that nice hip positioning in the bottom of the squat. He demonstrates on this guy's channel. I forgot what this guy's name is, but um, it's, it's pretty good content of how he explains and you, you can get a partner to help you find that, that nice position and then you can play around with that. But um, I apologize on behalf of this guy's channel that is, um, shot this video with a potato so the image quality is not that great but the content's pretty good so go and check that out if you want to find out more of your, about your stance and, and how to get into that deep squat pain free all right next um so the key takeaways so depending on your build you should adjust the bar placement stance hip direction to find the optimal knee uh hip and knee angle balance. So as I said, uh, balanced angles from knee and hip joint. Um, everyone's built differently. The right arrangements for you is the one that allows you to lift the most weight safely to competition standards. Obviously, if you're, you're a powerlifting competitor, you want to squat to death, etc. So after all this, after this trial and error, if you still have difference between angles of your hips and knees, this will result in either if you're hip or knee dominant, and that's okay, all right? So, um, you know, if you squat better high bar with a narrow stance, then squat with a high bar and narrow stance if you squat the most weight and, and that's pain-free. Or if you squat low bar with a wide stance and you do that pain-free and you can squat the most weight, then squat that way. So at the end of the day, it's whatever technique gets you to lift the most weight the most safely um, and along with trying to get that balance and if you can't get that balance and that's that's fine you just you you work out you're either hip or knee dominant so that's all i've got for my slides and yeah cheers all right that's great okay i think i think we always spoke about very different things yeah yeah so cool. 
So now we are having the round table where we discuss on the things that we have mentioned among the three of us, even though it's a, a little bit weird because uh, we are trying to present to you guys, the viewers. So once again, we are trying this out. And if you guys are really interested in joining us in this kind of Zoom calls, because uh, we'll be answering questions in a later part and uh, we'll put out a poll in future on IG so that you guys can participate in it and join us. Okay, so right now, uh, I would like to provide my view on the presentations today. I feel that like all three of us have our own similarities uh, in the view of a uh, hip dominant and quad dominant squatter, uh, just that the illustration is a little bit different. In my case, I speak a little bit more about uh, the torso angle in relation to how much dorsiflexion you can create. Um, JJ illustrates a squat in a more uh, perspective of a lawn mower, which is moving this way, and uh, a lift, which is moving up and down. Okay, and whereas Adam, it's uh, also quite similar to what we have said. It's more towards like the first understanding the concept of a talk and then looking at relation to the hip angle, to the knee angle and the uh, ankles. Okay, so all three of us always, uh, I believe uh, that we always want to have a more balanced squat uh, where we try to use our whole lower body together. So if you are someone who feels that uh, when they squat, they cannot feel the knee extensors that when they are squatting, most probably it's a more movement pattern issue. So instead of thinking, oh, if I cannot feel my legs means I'm a hip dominant squatter, you should think of, okay, if I cannot feel my legs and I find difficulty coming up all the time, I should look at the movement pattern I'm creating. Am I doing it right? What are the things that I need to improve on to create that full experience of the lower body to do the work? This is uh, my key takeaway with regards to this question. Whereas if you are more knee dominant person and I have a lot of athletes who doesn't hit that and uh, feel a lot of knee pain. So if you are someone who squats and experience a lot of knee pain, uh, you need to go back to what is the most trendiest way of squatting right now, which is trying to sit back. So a lot of people, especially a gen pop, lah, so they, when we first ask them to squat, it is very hard for them to visualize the squat as something that you need to require hips to do. So what they do is just bend the knees because uh, they don't understand the concept of squatting. They don't squat. Okay, so they will bend their knees forward as much as possible and create so much tension on the knees. So they need to try and sit back more to allow the hip to do the work to create that balanced situation. Okay, so this <laughs> is my view. Lah. So what do you think? Yeah, I, th I think we've got very you know, similar perspectives, but... Uh, articulate it in a very different way mm -hmm. well, well kind of similar but very individualized um, which I find really interesting it's pretty cool um, yeah. I think if you made it all the way to the, through this video I think you've got three different perspectives on the squat and 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 three different ways of ex explaining it and I think I think that's great I think that's you know you've gained more knowledge in a different way or, or, or different, uh, you know, perspectives, and I think, yeah, I think whatever gels with it, someone, the best. I think you, you're still on the wrong, right path. So, I feel that I feel that like the information that we are providing with three different perspectives of this question allows you to actually see what should be done to your squats in future instead of asking yourself whether a hip dominant or quad dominant person. So, which is quite cool. We yeah. expanded this question into a more valuable content for you guys. Because if you just want to answer whether you are a hip dominant or quad dominant person, I just need to ask you, where do you feel, number one? And number two, how does it look? And then I'll tell you, okay, you are a hip dominant person, but we don't want to provide this kind of nonsense content. We want to give you value. So, this is what we have given you. JJ, what yeah, do you and think? I think also that, like, like, just because you can identify if you're more quad dominant or hip dominant squatter, no, it's not going to make you, it's not helpful information in terms of the fact that it's not going to make you squat better. It's not going to translate to a better numbers on the bar. We want to think about what are the 
what are the ways that we can kind of adjust your techniques in so that you can use uh, the most amount of muscle to do the, uh, more of the work. And I think that it's also quite interesting how, for example, like Adam, Adam's perspective on the whole issue is that you can adjust your, your stance. <clears throat> and for me, it's about using more sort of uh, exercise selection. Mm. And for Quinta, it's more about creating that uh, torso angle as well. So I think, I think that what we've provided is like three different perspectives. So I think one of the good things is that whenever you face an issue with your technique, I think you don't have to, I think if you, you have one problem, but if you only have one lens of looking at the problem, then, uh, well, the, the analogy is this, if you only have a hammer, then, then every problem is a nail, right? So even if something is a, even if the problem is a screw, you will use a hammer to hammer on the screw, which is not the which is not the right tool for the job. So I think that we've provided you three different kind of like tools to look at the same problem. So based on how you look at the, based on what you think your problem is, you can use these different tools to address, um, uh, to address the issue that you're facing. And I think that uh, is 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 good to have in terms of what are the guiding principles between. Uh, when you analyze a movement pattern as quote unquote simple as the squat, because it's not, it's not, you're not really running, you're not jumping, you're not doing a power clean or anything. It's just a squat, but yet there's so many different perspectives on how to look at it and how to optimize it for, for you. Yeah. I like, I like the way you added in the periodization and program selection for JJ, mm. because it actually plays a part in, uh, in the whole spectrum of improving your squat or in fact in powerlifting. So um, another thing I want to add on is developing and having that coach's eye and perspective and also their mental process is, uh, is, mm-hmm. uh, is through years and years of experiences. So I think with the presentation we have shown you, it can present and give you an idea of a rough uh, background of how you can judge your own squad. But obviously, you cannot use this to uh, go around after the circuit breaker, go around telling people, hey, you cannot score like that and uh, etc, etc. But I mean, it is perfect for you to to direct them to our video, obviously, because we want more uh, people to look at us. Uh, but the bottom line is if you want actually if you actually want to really find out how to improve your squat, um, it is important to have a professional's perspective of it. So obviously you need to find the coach and communicate with them and see what are the things that can be improved to help you. And through phases of different training, which is periodization towards a competition, you design exercises which will help target that problem uh, one at a time. Yes, I also think I also think one of the important things is uh, about having principles instead instead of methods. Is also you can you can you can apply the principles will always hold through for all the situations. Yeah, so correct. if you get someone that with very very long femurs, um, they will have to you have to use the principle to organize their technique. Yeah. And if you have only have a method which is which is uh might might be something like oh lean forward lean forward is a method. Widening your stance is a method, but if you don't understand that, okay, why the methods come about, then you will you will just you will literally tell someone, okay, if your squat doesn't work, uh, maybe you should try widening your stance. But like there there isn't a sort of like targeted focus as to, or there isn't a reason why, uh, that you you are being led to using that method. So if you if you can understand that, okay, I need to widen out my stance because widening out my stance creates a creates a shorter sort of moment arm because now I've brought this distance into this distance. Mm. So you see how much shorter this is, just widening out my stance. You will, you will then be able to maybe uh, use your hips more or use your, or use your knees more and stuff like that. It's also the same reason um, uh, like why people pull so more over conventional and, and it's just one of the, like if you can understand, okay, why, why do I organize and why do I use this method? then you can use the you can apply it to any situation where you see yeah so if and it's like yes even though we are all very very different we are still this we still have 
ball and socket joints. We still have, we still have femurs. We still have knees. We still have uh, knee ligaments. We still have quads. Still have hamstrings. Still have, still have glutes. So if you can understand what the muscle action and function is, you can uh, you can understand that okay, this this is how we need to organize our technique so that we can use more of that use more of that muscle or like hit the appropriate depth and stuff. Yeah. I really like what you said about principles and methods, man. So, um, throughout all the video, like this whole video, um, I can give you, I can give the viewers a little bit of a task, which is uh, from how we are presented and whatever we are presented, you can pinpoint to us and put down in the comments below which one of it are methods provide to you or and which one of it are principles provided to you so that you can become uh, an activity for you guys to do. Adam, anything to add on? Yeah, uh, just to go back to what JJ was saying, um, I'm glad you, you you said about the stance width because I totally forgot to talk about why you do that. And yeah. that's just the changing that uh, distance uh, within the knee and hip joint. So obviously, like, oh, not obviously, but like, you know, maybe with someone with a, you know, a short torso and long femurs, maybe a high bar would be better for them to get that, that more balance between the knee and hip joint. But I'm not saying that's for all, but that's just worth exploring. This is why you, you, you know, if your spot doesn't feel right, then, and it, you know, you, you, getting bothered with pain and all that sort of stuff. This is why it's worth just exploring different bar positioning. Don't be so dogmatic about the bar positioning on your back because not everyone has to squat yeah. low bar, you know, like there's guys that break world records that squat high bar. So just the majority of people squat low bar. Okay. Um, so just be very open-minded with technique, you know, as I said, at, at the end of my slides, you know, the best technique is the one that lets you uh, lift the most weight safely, pain-free to legal competition, uh, legal, that's legal in competition. So you don't need to squat like this guy or that girl or whoever, you need to explore and find which works best for you. And, and I admit this too, uh, along with, you know, I know you guys do this as well. This is where, you know, if we're further away from competition, we're like, okay, I know I've got lots of time. I've been really wanting to explore what I'm like in heels, but I just haven't had that time to really explore and adapt and then get used to it. So this is why you just got to be so just, just open to try new things and seeing how the body moves. But I'm not saying that, you know, don't try and fix that's what's not, uh, what's not broken, it's, but just... Just be open-minded and, and, and trying to develop your technique over time because technique is something that's not always per it's never going to be perfect it's never going to be the your best technique it's, it's something that we're just always continuing to develop and get better so but, but i think also in terms of developing technique and going back to sort of exercise selection mm -hmm. This is, this is kind of a, a bit of a personal annoyance is when you use an exercise, you got to also understand the principle of why you're using an exercise, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to use a heel elevated goblet squat, for example, in order to make yourself more upright, but at the end of the day, you're still hinging an exercise, right? Mm -hmm. And you're still going to be training the same, you're going to be re-patterning the same poor movement patterns, right? So, so I, see, <clears throat> I see a lot of people, they want to do like heavy, Especially now, because a lot of the a lot of people don't have um like gyms and stuff, so they were trying to think of new exercises to train their to train themselves, right? So some people I've seen I've seen people use searcher squats, I've seen people use goblet squats, I've seen people use um like all sorts of variations of squats, right? But the issue is they're not really using it to to give themselves a better movement pattern because when they, for example, I think one of the things that I still feel turned by is when I see Wei Pin do goblet squats in the gym. He also tends to want to hinge the goblet squat. So he will hit, he will go down like this, and then he will kind of do this instead. So his pelvis is still creating that, that same hinge pattern. And he might feel a bit more quad, but I would argue that sometimes when you look at the 
an exercise and the intention, you don't just do it and so the focus of the exercise is also very important. And I think like a good coach will communicate with you effectively what and cue you effectively on what the end point of the exercise is. And I think that's something that um that's something that a lot of people miss out when they choose different exercises. They just think that um oh I'm I'm picking a uh, exercise that's meant to be more court dominant, but I still perform it in the same way as as the way I squat anyway. So are you actually creating a better movement pattern and targeting the right muscles or are you just making what you're already uh, sort of strong at, even stronger and not working on your weaknesses? So I think that's also something that's very important. If you, if you know why you're picking exercise and the intention will drive how you perform the exercise. Yeah. Do do what that exercise is intended to do, and do it with intention. Yeah. And if you don't know, ask your coach or exactly. look at return to your principles and ask yourself why am I doing this exercise? And don't just do exercises because you see your favorite uh, like Instagram uh, influencer or your favorite lifter do it. Like yeah, um, yeah. Like for example, like BFR split squats because. Because USAPL lifter is doing like why yeah. like are you even are you even in a like are you in a do you have the best <clears throat> like is is a, is a split squat like a front foot elevator or like the difference between a front foot elevator and a rear foot elevator split squat or like a Bulgarian split squat why or like does my Bulgarian split squat need to be like does my rear leg need to be like ten inches of the floor instead of six inches of the floor. Or like, like all of these things matter. These things matter. But and if you don't have a principle of asking yourself why, why is why is someone like Clinton doing a front foot elevated as opposed to me doing a rear foot elevated or a Bulgarian? Like I think all of these things you need to return to your principles to decide. Okay, why are they important and how are they actually improving my squat? It's not just I'm doing it because of variation. It's like yeah, your body doesn't know the difference. Your body knows that okay i'm using one muscle more than another yeah so i think unless you are a very skilled uh lifter who knows what they are doing and understand the principle it is not wise for you to anyhow select your exercises and do it without intention yeah. Yeah. so make sure you know what you're doing find the principle of it instead of methods or just doing it without thinking or if you want to keep it very easy, just hire a coach. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. or, or ask or ask your coach, why Why am I doing this? Yeah, why ask your coach. This? Or, I mean, if you don't have a coach, you can ask, ask. Because right here, we are trying to help you guys understand and provide you with a better understanding of how powerlifting works, how your body works in, uh, to improve the sport of powerlifting. So this is what we'll do for you. All right, so uh, anything else before we wrap it up? I'm good. All right, man. So we have come to the end of this video. Uh, I'm still <clears throat> not sure how long this video uh, actually is, but if you actually enjoy this video and you have questions to ask, uh, feel free to drop down a comment on YouTube or you can just DM us on our Instagram page and we can try our best to answer it for you. So once again, this is uh, Clinton, JJ, and Adam uh, presenting to you. And next week, we'll come up with the next question, which is uh, the bench arch, which is quite interesting because um, out of all the questions, you guys decide to select the two toughest questions for us to answer. But it's cool. We'll, we'll do it for you guys. So um, yeah. if you like this video and feel this video, it's very useful to you. Please feel free to share it to people who are in need and like and subscribe to our youtube channel till then i'll see you again bye bye yeah